This is the last topic in this unit. Biomes of the world. Okay? Now, the way this is going to get assessed, so you kind of know how to what, what to watch for and, and that kind of thing here is there will be multiple choice questions with pictures and descriptions of the biomes. A biome is an ecological region on Earth that has thank you, Michael, uh, that has very specific climate patterns and like animals and plants and stuff like that. Okay? So the world can be divided up into these different groups or biomes or regions. Okay? So I would give a picture and a description on a multiple choice item and then you would have to pick which one it is. That would be one way. The other way is in the written response. I'm going to combine this with climate, with climate graphs. So I'll put a climate graph on there, which you will have to analyze, and then tell me which of these ecological regions or biomes you think it goes with and why. Okay, so it, in one question I assess that you can read and interpret a climate graph and that you understand what biomes look like and what their properties are. Okay, so that's the two ways that this lesson will be assessed on Thursday and again on the final. Okay? Because the last question on your final exam is a climate graph final question, just like the one you're going to get on Thursday. Spoiler alert. Okay. All right. Um, so be able to identify a biome from either a picture or description. That's the multiple choice part. Match a climatogram or climate graph to a specific biome and justify your choice. Okay. So if we look at the ecological regions on Earth, biomes. This is what it would look like, okay? Where each of the biomes that we're going to talk about, the nine ones essentially we're going to talk about, okay, um, are distributed. So the light green color, right? So this, this right here, the light green color, that's the tropical rainforest, okay? So where do we find tropical rainforest? Yes, some there, but I was actually thinking of more general area. South America, even more general. Uh, like places near the equator? Yes, places near the equator. An area of the world we call the tropics. Yeah, it's not by accident. Okay, this is a place on the in the world where we don't, where the seasons essentially don't change, other than like rainy and dry. Okay, they get the same amount of sunshine all year long, and that changes, you know, what kind of things can grow there. And rainfall, of course, affects that stuff like that. So we typically see it in places like most of South America, right? So that would be, you know, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, okay? all of those kind of places, the Amazon, okay? That's all here, okay? And then there's bits of it in Africa, okay? Um, half of Madagascar is, is that way, okay? All of Southeast Asia, so this would be like Southern China, Laos, uh, Vietnam, Okay, uh, Thailand, okay, places like that, and then all of all of the like South Pacific. So that would be like Papua New Guinea and places like that. All tropical rainforest. The Philippines, all tropical rainforest. Okay, and you've got a little bit in kind of Central America. So you've got like Jamaica, Cuba, Trinidad and Tobago, places like that in the Caribbean. Okay, um, yeah. So that's all where we would find the tropical rainforest. All of it is between. 23 and a half degrees south and 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. Not by accident, that's the tilt of the Earth axis. Okay. All right. Um, the savanna, which is what you would typically associate with Africa. Okay. Like lions and tigers, but not bears, and giraffes and, and things like that. Okay. That's where you find the bulk of the true savanna. Okay. There are ecological regions that are like the savanna that are not found in Africa. That would be little bits of it um, in Australia, okay, and some in South America, but like this area right here is more man-made than naturally occurring. Okay, due to a lot of deforestation, it's a bit more like a tropical grassland, that's what a savanna is, okay, than it is a tropical rainforest. Okay, um, and then you get uh, some desert, okay? Well, true desert. Now, true desert does not mean like what you would see in a Star Wars movie for like Tatooine, okay? You know, it's, it's not the rolling sands of Tunisia, which is where they film all of that, okay? It, very little of the desert in the world actually looks like that, okay? It's what we picture, but it's not actually what most of it looks like. Much of it is actually rocky and dry as opposed to 
shifting sand dunes and things like that. Okay? Um, so most of the true or hot desert is here. Okay? It's North Africa. Right, so it's you know it's Egypt, Morocco, you know places like that, Tunisia, obviously. Okay, uh, all of the Middle East. Okay, so Saudi Arabia, the uh, United Arab Emirates, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait. Okay, all those places are all deserts. Okay, very hot, very dry. Okay, uh, there's also the outback of Australia, it would also be a hot desert, but it's a rocky desert. Um, and then you've got um, much of Mexico. Okay, like especially here in like Mexicali. Okay, the northern parts, uh, like that would be like Tijuana, uh, places like that. Okay, you got some desert in there that would be hot but rocky desert, not sandy desert. Isn't the desert, it looks like the desert's going for like it's, it's, it's a lighter, lighter gold color. Um, so it's the grassland. Yeah, it does kind of look that way, but there's actually a bit of a difference between like this desert and like this would be, right in here would be like Arizona, Nevada, right? Like this would be the, uh, the Mojave. Um, but then this is grassland here. It's a slightly lighter gold color. Yeah. All right, uh, so very hot, very dry. Look at this desert right here. What, what's, what's this thing right here? <coughs> it's, all this, it's like suddenly blue and white. There's something that runs right here. It's on the border of India and Pakistan. Tibet. That's the Himalayas. Okay. This is the Himalayan mountain range right here. Look at the rain shadow behind it. It's almost like someone was shining a light and casting a shadow behind where there's no precipitation. Okay. That's the idea of a rain shadow desert. Okay. It actually looks like there's a shadow behind. Because look what's on the other side of the Himalayas. Tropical rainforest. Okay. It's just like over here. Okay, in, in Canada, where we've got the Rockies, okay, blocking all of the rain and making a grassland behind it. Okay, making a rain shadow behind. Here, the Mojave is a rain shadow desert. Right, like New Mexico and places like that are also a rain shadow desert. Right? So we see those in lots of places. Okay, uh, the kind of whitish blue that you see on the tops of all the mountain ranges, the top of the Rockies, top of the Himalayas, okay, this would be like the, the Alps here, um, I can't remember what those ones are. Um, this would be like a, a string of uh, volcanoes that would include Mount Kilimanjaro. Okay? Um, and then this would be the Andes down here in South America that makes a rain shadow behind in, like, into um, Argentina okay, and Chile. Um, yeah, so you see those, that's extreme desert. There's nothing but rocks and ice. Now there's one big section of this that <coughs> doesn't appear on this map. What other place that doesn't appear on this map would be all extreme desert? Desert Island. North Pole's actually on here. You can see it in like Greenland is all that, that color. Antarctica. Antarctica. For some reason, Antarctica does not appear on this map, but it would all be that color. Nothing but rocks and ice. Okay, so extreme desert is more of like a glacial desert. Okay? Antarctica is actually the driest It gets the least amount of rainfall. But it's been down hiding at the bottom of the world for so long that all the snow that fell there never melted, so it built up to be like, you know, thousands of meters thick. In some places. Okay, um, underneath that we've got Chaparral, okay, which is also, for some reason, known as the Mediterranean climate. You can't imagine why, okay, in so much as Italy and Greece and all those other places. Okay, around the Mediterranean exhibit this climate. It's hot, but it's not desert-like. They do get precipitation, okay, but it's hot, it's humid, um, and it leads to a very unique style uh, or kind of ecological uh, appearance um, in that area. We do see little bits of it in like Southern California, little bits of it here on the tip of Africa, and the southern tip of Australia. Okay, it could also be considered Mediterranean or chaparral. All right, temperate grassland, right? So all the gold color, sorry, yes. Okay, all the gold color stuff, that's like, we <coughs> call that prairie. Okay? The prairies are temperate grassland. So you can see that most of the Midwest of the United States and all of the prairie provinces, they are that color. So we kind of know what it looks like because we just have to look out the window and we see it, okay? It's the rolling fields of grain, okay? 
Um, and then we also see a lot of it in Asia and even a little bit of kind of like Europe and, and that area. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've got lots of food producing area because the prairies, the temperate grasslands tend to be our main agricultural regions, our main food production areas. Okay. There's some of it obviously in Australia as well and little bits and pieces of it in Africa and South America. Um, and then we've got the temperate deciduous forest, right? So that would be like if you've been to Ontario, okay, southern Ontario specifically, or you've been to the eastern coast of the United States, you've been to like um, Vermont, okay, would be a prime example of, of that. Uh, anything in New England, New York, okay, uh, Massachusetts, all those kind of places, Pennsylvania, all of those would be um, temperate forest. So it's forest that loses its leaves every year. So this is where you would see maple, oak, okay, and things like that. So it's a forest, but it's not like a rainforest or anything. Then we've got taiga, okay? So if you've ever been to like Fort McMurray, or you've gone to Banff, okay, or anything like that, you've been in the taiga. There's two kinds of taiga. There's Arctic taiga, which would be like what you get if you go to Fort McMurray or further north, okay? And there's Alpine taiga, which is what you get if you go into the mountains to Banff and Jasper and Kananaskis and places like that, okay? Uh, and then the last one is tundra, okay? Um, there's ar Arctic tundra and there's Alpine tundra. It's what you see when you get above the tree line in the mountains, okay? So if you're, you know, walking up a mountain, doing a hike, and you're suddenly you're out of the trees and it's just kind of grass, that's, that's an Alpine tundra, okay? There's not enough soil, and there's also, too, it's too cold for trees to establish roots and grow effectively there. Right? And the same is true for the very northern parts of Canada and most of northern Russia. Okay? Um, that's going to be all Arctic tundra, just a grassland, an Arctic prairie, basically. All right, questions on that? Kind of where they're distributed? Because now we're going to go into the details of each one. Okay. okay, anybody ever been to the tropical rainforest? Okay. I guess you guys haven't traveled as much. I wonder why. Oh, well, it couldn't have been the unspecified point. virus of unknown origin. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we are looking at uh, a tropical rainforest, we see a canopy, actually several canopies, of trees. Okay? It is just everywhere. Okay? It's very warm or even borderline like hot, and it is very wet. Okay, it rains all the time in the tropical rainforest. That is what produces the conditions necessary to have plant growth like this. Okay? And a tropical rainforest at ground level is very different than being in the forest here in Canada. Okay? If you're in the forest here in Canada, you can see between the trees. Right? If you go into the tropical rainforest, you will be swallowed up by it. It is very easy to get lost because you can't see the sun. Okay. The canopy of trees blocks it. Um, everything just closes in around you. Everything looks different. Okay. If you do not bring a machete so that you create a path of destruction to follow back out, it is very, very easy to get lost. It's super, super thick and closed in, almost claustrophobic. Okay. All right, so the general characteristics of the tropical rainforest are as follows. They are complex. They are variable, very different from forests here in Canada which are not complex and not variable, okay? We have like, you go to a forest here in Canada and you got like five kinds of trees, okay? In a tropical rainforest, it's much, much different than that. It's very diverse, okay? Uh, there's no seasonality, no winter, no summer. Might be kind of a wet and a dry season, but that would be about it, all right? So you can see here, these are pictures of tropical rainforest in Hawaii, right? And so it's, um, it's everywhere. Like there's no tree line in a tropical rainforest. <coughs> it's just, it grows right up the sides, steep mountainsides, where in Canada no tree would ever be able to gain a foothold, right? And it's just because it rains all the time, okay? There's constantly an input of moisture and nutrients, so plants can grow everywhere, like a chia pet, okay? They can just climb up the sides of the mountains everywhere, right? Even on this, like, really steep spire, there's plants growing all over it, okay? Very dense, very thick. Okay, a climatogram for a tropical rainforest. No, in case it's on the test. Okay, um, would look like this. 
our temperature line is like flat. They get the same temperature all year long. There's very little change because they're near the equator. Okay? Would that be something you might work into an answer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If I show you a climatogram on the test like I'm going to, and you see that the line is flat, you should probably mention what that means. Hey, well, the temperature doesn't change here. It's quite high, so that means it's close to the equator. Okay. You just analyze the first part of that climatogram. Okay. Second part of the climatogram is, all right, look at the scale for the bars. The bars are very even, so the precipitation is even, constant throughout the year, and heavy. 200 millimeters of rain, okay, um, actually up to almost 225 as a maximum, and down to maybe 150 for a minimum. Okay, over the past three days, okay, where it's been raining and raining and raining here, we've got, I think, I think it's been like 25 millimeters of rain. Okay, and that's a lot for here. Okay, in 2013 when we had the floods, Okay, um, we got, uh, what was it, 77 millimeters of rain, and we got it in the space of a week. Okay, that would be a dry month in the tropical rainforest. Right, so it's very, very wet. Okay, um, the soils in the tropical rainforest, believe it or not, the, the huge forest, thick, luxuriant vegetation, crap soil. Okay? And the reason for that is it's constantly being eroded. There's always flooding, so the water is always rushing over the surface, picking up the small particles and washing them away. And there's lots of times where water sits on the ground. And if it sits on the ground, then diffusion can occur. So what happens is in the floodwaters, there's not a lot of dissolved minerals and nutrients and things like that, but there are in the soil. So they naturally move from an area of high concentration, the soil, to an area of low concentration, the water. And that's a process that we call leaching, because it's like a leech sucking the, the nutrients out of the soil. Okay? So it gets pulled out of the soil, and then the floodwaters either wash away, or they evaporate and deposit the salts on the top. Okay? You've actually seen that around here, because okay? over the past few years, with our, you know, the droughts that we've had, a lot of sloughs have dried up, and wherever they dry up, it's white. That's all the minerals that were in that water that have just been deposited, precipitated out onto the surface. Okay? But it does draw it out of the soil, so it actually means the soil is very bad. Okay? It's terrible for agriculture. Okay? Um, and that can be a problem because lots of people who live in the rainforest want to grow food, and it's, it's really poor soil. So what they'll do is they'll um, employ what's called slash and burn agriculture. So they will cut down all the trees, set them on fire, which is hard in the rainforest because it's wet. Okay. But they'll get them to burn and then they'll kind of dig the ash into the soil and that's about where the bulk of the nutrients are. And after a few seasons, the soil just is so depleted that nothing will grow. Okay. So it's not a great place for agriculture. Now that said, it produces a fair amount of food in the form of fruit and things like that because it's a rainforest. Um, but it's not good for agriculture, high density kind of farming. Um, okay, so the soil profile looks like this. You got your parent material, you got your sea horizon way down below, lots of bee horizon, and almost no topsoil. Okay, because it just washes away. The plants typically take all their nutrients out of the flood water. Okay, now for vegetation, okay, so it's super, super thick, it's super diverse and it's layered, right? So um, there are often up to eight different layers of vegetation from undergrowth, so right on the ground level, to the top of the canopy. Okay, so you got like your upper canopy, your mid canopy, your lower canopy, and then you've got your understory, middle understory, undergrowth, okay? And then probably some other layers below that, but there's many, many layers to a tropical rainforest, and different animals will live in different layers. And different plants obviously occupy different layers as well. Okay? There can be up to 100 different tree types per hectare. Okay? That means it's very diverse. Okay? If you go into Kananaskis, you won't even see 100 different kinds of trees in the whole park. 
In a tropical rainforest, in a space the size of the football field, one hectare, 100 meters by 100 meters, you could see 100 different kinds of trees. Thousands of trees in that space of hundreds of different species. Okay? So incredibly diverse. Right? You divide up the same space in the Canadian forest and you'd see black spruce, white spruce, Engelmann spruce, lodgepole pine, Douglas fir. That's it. Okay? That's not very diverse. And those usually grow at different altitudes. So if you're in one part of the forest, it's like all Engelmann spruce. And you go to the neck, you go up a little bit further, and it's all Douglas fir, and, then, and so on. Like it's just, it's very layered, not like the tropical rainforest. Yep. Okay, making sense? Right. I think I showed you this picture back in the biology unit. This is the different types of roots that lots of tropical rainforest trees will have. They'll have their anchoring roots that can pull water and keep them in the ground. And then they've got their snorkel roots okay, that can allow them to breathe when their roots are submerged. Okay. Plants around here, if their roots are submerged for any length of time, they actually suffocate. Okay. And, uh, and the plants will die in flooded conditions. All right. This is what a tropical rainforest can look like at ground level. Okay, um, it's uh, thick. It's why you take a machete with you into the jungle, right? Like just even moving around is difficult without you know cutting stuff out of your way. Okay, the animals that live in the tropical rainforest. Believe it or not, there are very few large animals in the tropical rainforest because you can't really live on the ground. It's flooded most of the time. You would not be a burrowing animal in the rainforest unless you were like a burrowing fish, okay? Because your house would be full of water all the time, okay? So there's no like gophers and ground squirrels and things like that. Most animals live in the trees and most of them are small, okay? So like this, like cute little guy, okay? Or this cute little guy. And then the not so cute things. There's lots of bugs. If you don't like bugs, don't go to the tropical rainforest. You will not enjoy yourself, okay? Lots of places in the true tropical rainforest, they have like a bug net over the bed, okay? If you forget to close it, you'll wake up sleeping with lots and lots of other things, okay? And they'll all be really creepy and look like that, okay? But if you don't like bugs, you won't have fun in the tropical rainforest, okay? Because there are bugs everywhere. And many of them are big. So if little bugs frighten you, I'm sure big bugs are worse. There's lots of big bugs. Okay? Like the dung beetle, which attract mates by making big balls of poop. True story. What's that? Spiders. Yeah, big spiders. Yeah. I like big bugs are less scary. Because I do not want to see them. Yeah, that's the thing. Or is that what makes them scary? Yeah, I guess for some people. Like Actually, yeah, okay. if, if the scorpion's bigger, it's, yeah, it's less deadly. Yeah. But scorpions aren't actually a tropical bug, they're a desert bug. Yeah. Still, yes, smaller is worse. Yeah. Like that Indiana Jones movie, right? The small one. Like, yeah. don't, don't be quiet about it, right? Okay, so um, in the tropical rainforest, most animals are what we call arboreal, which means they live in the trees. Okay, like the three-toed sloth. Okay, that's what this thing is. Okay, they're very chill because they're very slow. But they also don't have any like real big predators because they're fairly large themselves, one of the larger organisms in the jungle, and they live in the trees. Okay, um, if you put a sloth on the ground, they're almost helpless because they can barely move on the ground. All of their musculature is designed for hanging in the trees and being able to kind of move along in the trees or swing through the trees, okay? Um, so they actually have, you can kind of see it right here in this picture, their claws are like a coat hanger. They're really, really long and literally shaped like a coat hanger and they can go over the tree branches and literally hang out, okay? Just hanging there. They don't have to exert any force, they just have to hang. Okay, that's the way their, their back muscles and things like that are designed. But if you put them down on all fours, belly down, they can barely support themselves. All of their musculature is in their back. None of it is up front 
Okay, so they can't support themselves that way, which is why they're so slow. In very few parts, they're more of a savanna kind of animal, more of a grassland. Like this whole idea of the lion being the king of the jungle. Lions don't live in the jungle. Yeah, they live in the savanna. Which is, I mean, there's places in it that might look like jungle, but they're not really jungle. Okay. Um, food chains in the tropical rainforest are really, really long. Okay, you've got your producers at the bottom, your plants, and then you've got the bugs that eat the plant. And then you've got the bugs that eat the bugs that eat the plant. And then you've got the bugs that eat the bugs that eat the bugs that eat the plant. And she swallowed a spider to catch the fly, and it goes like forever, and then you've got like the lizard that eats the bug, that eats the bug, that eats the bug. Okay, and then you have like a bird. Okay, or, um, you know, something like this guy. Maybe that eats a bug or a lizard or something like that. The food chains are really long because there's, did I mention lots of bugs? There's lots of bugs. Okay. So the, the food chains are really, really long. One other problem for the rainforest is this. Many species of both plant and animal are endemic. And that means they're only found in one very small area. Okay, So a bit of deforestation could possibly render something extinct because it only lived in that small area. Okay? That was the only place on Earth it would be found. Okay? So they're finding that there's a lot of that. Okay? Um, if something is really brightly colored like that frog, what does that generally mean? It's yeah, it generally means it's poisonous. Okay? Um, lots of them will have like toxins on their skin that keep birds from eating them. Okay? Uh, if people eat them, it can kill you, but it can also um, have other effects on you. Like, have you ever heard like people licking frogs and then they have like a hallucinogenic experience? That's the thing. Okay. Um, but yeah. yeah, or the yeah, the ones that they use to poison their darts. Right, there's, there's natives in certain places that use the poison from the back of frogs to make their darts for hunting. Okay, because um, it'll paralyze things. Yeah, all that stuff is is a real thing. Okay. All right. Um, in the tropical rainforest, chemical cycling is very very rapid because it's hot and it's wet and there's lots of bacteria <coughs> and fungi and all the kinds of things that break stuff down quickly. Okay, so tropical rainforest, if a tree falls in the tropical rainforest, it'll be gone in a couple weeks. Okay, like it, it's literally that fast. There's lots of insects that can break it down into small pieces, termites, things like that. Okay, um, that'll break things down quickly, mold and, and fungi that can grow on it right away and before you know it, it's gone. Okay, a tree falls in the Canadian forest and your children will still see it. Okay? And their kids will probably see it too because it just takes forever for stuff to break down here. Okay, um, next one, savanna. All right, so the African safari kind of area. Okay? Um, it's a tropical grassland. Okay? We've got tropical rainforest. The savanna is a tropical grassland. It gets about the same amount of rain as the tropical rainforest. What's different is when. The tropical rainforest gets lots of rain and it's steady. The savanna has a monsoon season and a dry season. Okay? And by monsoon, I mean they measure the rainfall in meters. And then a dry season where it literally doesn't rain a drop for four months okay? or more. Okay? So it's a very, it's, they get lots of moisture, but they only get it in a short period of time. So it's not enough to grow complex forests but it's okay for a grassland. And when I say grassland, don't picture grass around here. Okay? Unless you have that grass that they grow everywhere in town, that Carl Forrester grass that gets like taller than you. I don't know if you've seen that around. They get that in the African savanna. Okay? They can get, that grows a lot. Not that particular species, but stuff like it. Okay? Um, so what you will see in the, in the savanna that's very different from the tropical rainforest is herds of large animals. Okay. There aren't a lot of large animals in the rainforest, but in the savanna, it's dominated by large animals, okay. especially large herbivores. Okay, so climate. Okay. Um, distinct dry season, lots of plants will estivate, that is, go dormant, but for the opposite reason that they go dormant here. It's because it's going to be hot and dry. Here they go dormant because it's going to be cold and dry. Okay. Uh, so the climate looks like this. Okay. There's our monsoon season, where you can see in a month, they'll get 350 or more millimeters of rain, okay? And then um, drops down to virtually nothing for several months, 
okay, and then it comes back up. So, um, and the temperature has a very tropical pattern to it. It's pretty much a flat line. Okay? But that's how you can tell the difference between a savanna and a tropical rainforest. Lines are flat for both, but the precipitation patterns very different. Okay? Monsoon season, dry season for savanna. Okay, so we got the cheetah here. What is it sitting on? Not a rock. <laughs> it's like one of those like termite. Yeah, it's a termite mound. It's the termite equivalent of an anthill. Okay? You see those a lot in the savanna. There are tons and tons of termites and bugs okay, in general, but especially termites. Okay? Termites will eat anything that is plant-based. Okay? Um, in like North America, we virtually don't have to worry about them because our northern climate is, is going to keep them away. But in tropical areas, their building codes like are centered around insect damage, specifically termites. There are some breeds of termites that if they got into your house, your house would collapse. Okay, like they'll eat through a tree in no time. Okay, they just they're voracious and they eat everything, and that's why it's actually very hard for plants to seed themselves in the tropical or in the uh, savanna. The seeds get consumed by bugs, mostly termites. So very few seeds actually land and germinate successfully, which is why you don't see a lot of trees. Okay? Grass will grow from its own root system, so they, they do okay and they grow back. Okay? But seeding yourself is very, very difficult. All right, so lots and lots of termites okay, um, in the rainforest. Or sorry, in the savanna. Okay. So lots of the trees, and I mean, there's areas where there's trees, and then there's trees that just stand alone, um, are fire resistant. Because of the long dry season, wildfires are actually a really big problem. Okay? Like a big, you know what a prairie fire looks like here. It's kind of like that. Okay? And they'll just rip through wide spaces of the savanna during the dry season. But lots of the plants will be dormant when that goes through. Their bark is very porous. And so even though the bark will burn, because the, the bark is porous, it actually insulates the interior of the plant, and the plant can survive a touch of fire. An intense fire is still going to kill it, okay, burn it right to the ground. But um, if it's just a light touching of fire, trees like the eucalyptus tree can survive that, okay, because they've got this porous bark that will protect them. Um, so yeah, you see spaces where there's trees, okay, and most of the trees have kind of this shape here. They're very flat on the bottom. It's even easier to see here. They're flat on the bottom, and they're shaped like an umbrella. Okay, A lot of the trees, especially ones that are out in the open like that, are shaped that way. Why? There's actually two reasons. Exactly. Most animals, with the exception of the giraffe, which is why it evolved such a long neck, okay, can't reach them to eat them. What's the second reason? Uh, no, it won't get that deep. It's a good guess, though. No, but they won't. It won't get that, quite that deep. It's actually the opposite of the rainy season. Does it, do a little sunlight? Um, it helps get sunlight. It actually helps protect the roots from sunlight. I mean, think you use a, a umbrella for two things: protect you from the rain and shade. Yeah, you get shade from the sun with it. That's what's happening here. They grow outwards and they shade their own roots so the soil around their roots doesn't get as dry during the dry season. Okay, so they get that umbrella shape. You can see it here too, like lots of them have that umbrella shape. Okay, um, so you got lots of, um, you got some trees. They'll be like woodland areas. But for the most part, it's really tropical grassland. And tropical grassland looks a lot different than like North American grassland. Okay. Um, there's this stuff called elephant grass that grows in the savanna, and it's aptly named. They call it elephant grass because an elephant can walk through it, and you won't see them. It's that tall. Okay. And people didn't believe me when I was telling like I taught this. I've taught this lesson for years and years and years, and for so long, people didn't believe me. And then I had a kid in my class who grew up in South Africa, and then came here. 
and I was talking about this elephant grass. And he's like, oh yeah, you, you wouldn't believe this stuff. Said, it's like bamboo, except not as thick, and it grows really tall. He said, let me get you a picture of my summer house. You see his house? Whenever they would go to their summer house, they would have to go and get the sides. You know that thing the Grim Reaper has? Okay, yeah. that's for cutting down grain. Okay, and they would go out and they would just walk back and forth and they would just keep swinging it. Okay, and when you swing it, it cuts down the long grass. Okay? That's how they would be able to like get the house trimmed away so you could see it. Elephant grass can grow to be three meters or more in height. Okay, it's got a thick stalk. Kind of like, I don't know, have you, you guys have seen the Carl Forrester grass around here, right? The stuff that grows, it grows probably about like chin high for most of us, okay? I've got a lot of it in my yard. It's nice for shade. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's like that, but like even taller, okay? So it'd be thicker, kind of like bamboo, but not really, not that strong, okay? Um, but yeah, it's, it's super thick, but it also represents a lot of food energy, which is why there's so many big herds of herbivores in the savannah, like wildebeest, zebras and giraffes and water buffalo and stuff like that. They, they, there's just tons and tons for them to eat. On the other side of that, that means that there's going to be large predators like lions, tigers, cheetahs, jackals, hyenas. Okay? All of those things are predators in this bite. Okay, uh, in, in the savannah, the soils are similar to soils here. They're sandy and they're super thick. The A horizons are really, really thick because grass every year goes dormant and then grows from the roots. So you always get a really thick thatch layer okay, of dead grass from the previous year that will decompose and add to the topsoil. Okay? So for the animals, okay, animal diversity is low compared to the tropical rainforest, and food chains are super short. The top predator often preys directly on the herbivore. Okay, so you got like producer, primary consumer, top carnivore. Okay? Your top carnivore is like a secondary consumer, where in a lot of um, food chains there are quaternary consumers. Okay? So you got like primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, okay? like they're often the secondary. They prey directly on the herbivore. Okay? Um, but you can see it's mostly grassland. There's you know a few trees here or there. Lots of large animals. Exactly the opposite of the tropical rainforest. Okay? And we talk here about the uh, scavengers. Lots of scavengers, buzzards, hyenas, okay, things like that that you know eat what's left after the lions are done with it. Okay, um, stuff like that. Okay, and chemical cycling in the rain, or sorry, in the savanna does tend to be fairly fast. It is, after all, quite warm, and there is a significant wet season. So uh, fungi and things like that, and lots of insects, again, um, can really help with the decomposition. Right? Again, here's that umbrella shape. You can really see it on this tree, okay? On this tree, it's very flat on the bottom, okay? And look, there's all these animals enjoying the shade, okay? But the branches are way too high for them to eat, so it's all good. All right, questions on the savanna? Okay. All right, desert. It's really what? Yes, that was the answer to my question. Dry. dry, really dry. That's what they all have in common, because there's different kinds. There's hot deserts, there's mid-latitude deserts, okay? and there's polar deserts, which are kind of their own thing. But, um, this is actually a mid-latitude desert, like in Arizona. Really hot summers, but they also have winter. Okay? If you go to Utah, like Utah is also a hot desert and they get snow. And there's places in Arizona that get snow. Flagstaff has a ski hill. Okay? So there's, there's places in Arizona that do get snow. Not a lot of it, obviously, but it gets, there's definitely a winter and a summer. But you can still have a desert at that latitude. Okay? If you go to places like um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, they're in the rain shadow of the Himalayas, they get winter. Okay? Quite cold there in the wintertime. Um, so those are mid-latitude deserts, okay? Tropical deserts, okay, are more like what you'd see in North Africa, okay? Hot and dry, or the Middle East, hot and dry, okay? All right, so this would be um, a hot desert, okay? Or a more of like a tropical desert. So the lowest temperature we'd see is about 24 degrees, and it goes up to about 36 degrees. If this was like uh, Dubai, it would look more like this. 
actually that line's probably a little bit low. Okay, like Dubai can be like 40 every day, like last summer, but every day, all year long. Okay, so it's very, very hot. Okay, uh, we don't see much of a bell curve. This may be bordering on the mid latitudes. And then look, look at how many months have zero precipitation. Okay, the wettest month in millimeters, okay, is 60. 60 millimeters, I don't even have a ruler. 60 millimeters, that's, that's 60 millimeters. That's the wettest month, okay? That's nothing, okay? And there's a whole bunch of months where there's literally nothing in terms of precipitation, okay? So very dry, very hot. If this was a mid-latitude desert, so if we were looking at, if we were looking at like uh, Utah or Arizona or something like that, okay, then our, our, bell, our temperature curve would probably look more like this. Okay, and there would be a definite increase to summer and decrease to winter. Okay? The big thing for deserts is dry. Okay? Many months without precipitation or with less than 10 millimeters of precipitation. Okay? Biggest, thing I, biggest hint I can give you for looking at the climatograms is look at the scale. This scale is set up to make this place look really dry. For whatever reason, the, temp the precipitation scale goes up to 400 millimeters. Like we could show a tropical rainforest on that scale. Okay, so it's made to look make this look really dry. But you can make a desert look wetter by simply altering that scale and having the top number be 60, and then all of a sudden your precipitation bars go all the way to the top. So my tip to you would be: don't just look at the shape; look at the scale too. The scale is important. Okay, vegetation, uh, not much, okay? There's some, but it's very widely spaced, okay? It's not like the tropical rainforest where things are like growing on top of each other, okay? In the desert, things are very widely spaced because water's the limiting factor, okay? And if they're overlapping each other, they're competing for water too much, so they generally tend to be far apart, okay? And you're gonna get uh, things like agave, okay? Is a desert plant, okay? It's what they use to make, um, well, like agave syrup, uh, tequila, okay, uh, mescal, mescal is made out of this. Um, yeah, it's it's um, kind of like a, almost like a pineapple. It's in the pineapple family, okay. Uh, so it's a, you know, kind of has a very sugary fruit and root system, okay. And then obviously you've got your cacti, lots of cacti, and lots of scrub, okay, like mesquite bushes and things like that are going to be able to grow uh, in those places. And short grasses, <coughs> really, really short grasses. All right. Um, would plants in the rainforest have, or sorry, in the desert have tap roots or fibrous roots? Thinking back to biology. Fibrous in general. There's the odd plant, like the mesquite bush, that has a tap root that'll go down and hit like aquifers, like well, wells and stuff. Okay? But for the most part, these plants have a fibrous root system, which is again why they're so far apart. Okay, soils. The parent material is usually pretty heavily eroded. Okay, so the gravels, like the rock, would be quite fine. Um, the B horizon is basically right at the surface because there's almost no topsoil. Okay, any organic material that could be used to build up a topsoil dries out and blows away. Okay, so it doesn't get a chance to really collect and build. So you have a very, very thin to absent topsoil. Okay? And it does tend to be pretty salty as well. When, when any rainwater that falls evaporates, anything that was in it or in the area okay, is going to be left on the surface. Okay? For the animals, well, they all have to be pretty drought tolerant. Okay? That's why you don't typically see many large mammals, camels being an exception. Okay? Um, but typically you don't see a lot of large mammals, rodents and insects are going to be your primary ones. And uh, you may also have uh, some kind of smaller predatory animals like foxes. Okay? But whatever lives here has to be able to survive without very much water. Okay? Some animals like that would live, let's say, in southern Alberta and even further south than that towards like Utah, Arizona, are like antelope. People have seen an antelope, pronghorn antelope. 
Southern Alberta, like deep Southern Alberta, um, but they can go their whole life drinking very little water by eating cactus. Okay, in the far south of Alberta and, and Montana and places like that, prickly pear cactus is actually pretty prevalent, um, and antelope have a tongue and inside of their mouth that's like shoe leather. Okay, so they can just bite down on a cactus, the needles break off and don't penetrate their kind of soft, like what would be for us soft mouth tissue. Okay, um, just breaks off, doesn't penetrate, doesn't hook them, and they can just chew on that and they get enough moisture out of it, um, generally for them to survive without having to drink very much water. Okay, uh, so they have a very efficient kidney. Okay? And would you be an animal in the desert that sweats? Okay, animals in the desert do not cool themselves by sweating. Okay, they'll pant, maybe. That uses a lot less water to cool you. Okay, or they'll be nocturnal. So they only come out at night when it's cooler. Okay, all kinds of adaptations to saving water. Okay, uh, for camels. Okay, obviously, like there's this whole idea that camels store water in their hump. That's not really how it works. Okay, there's a lot of fluid in the hump, but it's more like scar tissue uh, would be. Uh, so it's kind of bulbous. And yes, there's fluid in it, but it's not like oh, I'm thirsty. And they just bring it up. It doesn't work that way at all. Okay, um, it's actually more of a heat sink. So the way their blood vessels are arranged, blood that's hot will go through the hump, and essentially be cool uh, because it can transfer energy to that like kind of scar tissue. And the hump can actually run a different temperature than the rest of the camel. So the hump runs a fever. Kind of, and that can help keep the rest of the animal cool, especially the brain and internal organs. Okay, so it's kind of like that as opposed to it stores water in its home. Okay, um, okay for a rabbit, you see all the blood vessels in the ear? Okay, this is another way. We actually do this a little bit too when we're trying to cool ourselves. When you get hot, what happens to the color of your skin? Yeah, you kind of get flushed. Okay, you get that, you know, you notice it obviously if you're fairer skin, you, you flush easier. Uh, but um, our general response, okay, in all humans is that we'll get blood in the blood vessels near the surface. And the heat can radiate, because if someone's flushed, you can feel the heat coming off of them if you get close, okay? And then if we've got sweat on top of that, okay, as the sweat evaporates, you've got all that blood right at the surface being cool, okay? And so it works pretty effectively. For this rabbit, they just, get blood into those little capillaries and then they just flop their ears. Okay? Flopping their ears can help cool that blood and it doesn't use very much moisture at all. Okay? And they don't lose very much uh, water that way. Okay? But the bulk of the animals are going to be snakes and lizards and insects and small rodents because they can survive, they can be nocturnal, and they don't need a lot of water. Okay, chemical cycling in the desert basically doesn't happen. It requires moisture, and there isn't any. So if something dies in the desert, it just kind of desiccates. Okay? It just kind of dries up and turns to powder. Okay? But it doesn't really break down chemically. OK, the grasslands. See, I told you we were going to get through it all, but we'll do the rest. The grasslands, that's where we live. Okay, This is home for us. Now, that picture, does that look like a prairie? Like, there's cactus in that picture, isn't there? That's OK. Cactus grows in the, in the prairie. We were just talking about antelope okay, and how they uh, eat the prickly pear cactus. That's prickly pear cactus. Okay? This is a prairie. There's lots of different kinds of prairie. In Alberta, we go from like extreme short grass prairie in southern Alberta to long mixed grass prairie by Edmonton. Okay? We're kind of in the middle. Right? But there's lots of different kinds of prairie. It just depends on your precipitation. Okay? Now, in terms of climate graphs, this is Calgary. Most prairies have a climate graph that looks like this. Precipitation follows temperature. And June and July will be by far the wettest months. Here in Calgary, it's just June. Okay? I mean, July and August and, and May are up there, but June is by far the wettest. Okay? But you will definitely see the bars of a prairie follow the curve of temperature. The warmest months are the wettest months. Okay? The coldest months are the driest months. Right? It always follows that pattern. 
Okay, but if you look at um, precipitation, look at what the scale goes up to. It only goes up to 100. So this is actually still pretty dry. It makes it look wetter than it is because the scale is way different. If this had the same scale as that desert one we looked at, everything would be like, you know, that warm, that, that wettest month would be like here and everything else would be really, really small. So again, make sure you look at the scale. It, it can be misleading sometimes. All right, so this would be short grass prairie. This is taken just north of Medicine Hat at a place called Empress. Okay, very, very short grass prairie. And that's taken in early August. So it's already cooked and dormant. Right? They have a very short kind of growing season per se. Okay, so here's short grass prairie. Here's mixed grass prairie. Those are taken days apart. Okay, so Empress and then that's like St. Paul. Okay? So they are almost the same time of year, within a few days, and one's green long and the other's short and burnt. Are you sure they're rocks? Those aren't dead things. No, those are rocks. Yeah, those are rocks. They're not dead things. Not dead cows. No, they're, they're just rocks. Okay? All right, so lots of different kinds of grasses. Um, wheat grass, fescue. We've got lots of fescue around here. It's kind of the primary grass, native grass around here. Um, hairy oak grass, another one, spear grass, ground grass, okay, all those kind of things uh, can be found in this area. Okay, thick A horizon, super thick top, so don't pack up guys, only 10 on one, bells and go for two more minutes, I can get through this file, okay, you gotta give me a chance, don't pack up. Okay, uh, so thick A horizons, again, it's a grassland every year, the grass goes dormant, it leaves behind the blades, they decompose, okay, I won't get through this. <laughs> okay, this is supposed to be about animals. There's no animals in the picture. Why? What's that? They're not hiding, no. They're gone. Yes, unfortunately. The native animals of the prairies are not here anymore. They compete too much with our domestic livestock. So they have been eliminated. Okay? I mean, when you know, the indigenous people of Canada used to hunt buffalo, it was pretty sporty. Okay? You, you try and scare them and spook them and run them off a cliff. When the Europeans came with horses and rifles, it became a lot less sporty. Okay? I mean, a buffalo is a big target. You, if you can put a bullet through the broadside of a barn, you can hit a buffalo. Okay, we'll talk more about that tomorrow.